Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to 1000 Angels Investor Training. I am so excited to have you all here with me. I know we have loads of people signed up for today's session on the exciting topic of startup valuations. This is gonna be part two of Startup Valuations Explained. So if you missed part one, um, go through your emails. You probably have an email for me that contains the link to our YouTube channel where we keep our investor training library. So these masterclasses are such an important part of what we do at A Thousand Angels, which is not just helping our clients find really amazing, high quality, VC-led co-investment opportunities and startups, but also providing you guys with the tools, tips, and information that you need to really understand your investments. So today we're going to be digging into some of the math behind how we actually uh, determine and assess whether or not a startup's valuation is reasonable, as well as providing you access to some of the online tools that we provide to members and even potential members uh, that will help them understand their startup investments and the return potential a little bit better. So thank you guys for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will dive into our presentation. So here we go. All right, great. So I think everyone can see my screen. Um, you know, sound sounds good. So I think we're ready to go. We've got most of the people in the room. Uh, before we get started with uh, the details of the presentation, I do want to remind everybody that I love to keep these sessions very interactive. So feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat box um, to ask me any questions as we go along to sort of interact real time. Um, because some of the math in this stuff can be a little tricky, a little confusing. So if you have questions, you know, I am here to answer your questions uh, and dive in and we'll go ahead. So for those of you who don't know me yet, uh, or this is your first time watching our, one of our training sessions, my name is Erica Dagnan Minahan. I am co-founder uh, of 1000 Angels and Rain Ventures. 1000 Angels is a great digital platform that helps accredited investors build a portfolio of direct early stage uh, private equity investments. And Rain Ventures is a seed stage fund that invests in a very similar type of asset class. So we're generally dealing with companies that are raising, you know, they're between their first one and $5 million. Um, and we tend to make investments uh, from pre-seed rounds all the way through series B. So I've actually been investing in this stage of company for over 14 years. Uh, I started off as executive director of Golden Seeds, had a role as managing director at Dream Adventures, which is another really great fund. And during that 14 years, I've definitely invested in well over hundred early stage companies, uh, probably maybe even twice as much as that. So a little bit of my background, and I'm excited to share with you today some of the things that I've learned during my experience as an investor. So the, the primary topic that we're focusing on today is really, you know, understanding valuations, but also within the context of how the current market conditions have actually affected early stage valuations and what changes are we seeing in real time. So unlike you know, the stock market indexes, it's very hard to sort of get information uh, on what's going on in the aggregate. So we would like to be able to share that with you because we're seeing this in real time. And the reason this is so important is because it's critical for investors to be able to correctly evaluate startup valuations, but at the same time remain competitive when the market is changing. So we don't want to pay too high of a price, but we also don't want to understand, you know, what's too low, um, you know, what is sort of the right price at which a startup should be raising capital. So when you understand the basics of how to estimate a company's valuation and the current capital market conditions, then you can build a better portfolio for the long run. And that's really our job at A Thousand Angels is to be very aware of those market conditions and to share that information with you. So, you know, what's in our secret sauce? Well, we're gonna go over some of the basic guidelines to help you understand how we select deals and how we determine if they're appropriately valued. I always tell our clients, our job is to constantly search the market of early stage investment opportunities in order to select the ones that we believe will provide you 
with the best risk adjusted return potential. And that is based on building relationships with startup founders, getting to know companies, but also seeing everything that's out there so that we can know which are most attractive for you to add to your portfolio. And it also has to do with understanding not just the early stage capital markets, but the markets for follow on capital and how strong they are, as well as the potential exit opportunities that will allow our investors to monetize and find liquidity at the end of the day. So we're constantly monitoring these conditions uh, as companies grow and change and as we're dealing with different uh, challenges in the capital markets. And then the last thing that I really want to emphasize is that, you know, sometimes new investors get uh, into the market and, you know, they might see something that looks cheap, right? So a very low valuation, a $2 million pre-money valuation. We also want to talk about why we want to avoid deals that appear a little bit too cheap uh, for good reasons. They're probably lacking the proper team, traction, or product market fit. So when it comes to some of these elements of what actually drives value in a company, I would love for you to refer back to part one of our Startup Valuations Explained, uh, where we cover all of that sort of company-related stuff. So today we're going to be talking more structurally from a finance perspective, uh, how we establish proper valuation, and then also so what sort of valuations we're seeing in the market right now and those dynamics. So just remember a bad investment isn't made better by lowering the price uh, and a deal that's priced too low can actually hurt a chart startup's uh, chances of success. So let's get into the details today on valuation math methodology. So how do we back up all of these sort of, you know, um, subjective attributes of value uh, that we ascribe to a company with math that helps us actually build a high performance portfolio. So valuation methods definitely differ by investor type stage of investment, as well as the availability of capital. So, you know, we have, I would say, five major stages at which companies are thinking about evaluation. And at each stage, uh, we actually use different methods to determine the valuation. So at the seed stage, uh, it's a little bit more of sort of like deferred valuation methodology securities are used. Um, and really people are kind of looking at benchmarks. So at the seed stage, it's very much relative to, you know, where other similar deals are getting done. Um, you know, you might think of that uh, in relation to the way that people look at comps in the public equity market. But generally, there's about a range for, you know, that a company can raise successfully on evaluations for a certain stage of capital. At Series A, you're still very much looking towards benchmarks, but this is around when we really integrate what we call the VC method, um, and that's what we use here at 1,000 Angels uh, to value companies. So we'll be going into that in detail today. Uh, but so for seed in Series A, you're kind of benchmarking, you're probably using the VC method, and then once companies get to a growth equity stage or sort of private equity stage, uh, you know, all the way to the public markets. We're now looking at some of the more traditional valuation methodologies that you're probably actually familiar with. And so those include uh, multiple of revenues or EBITDA. Um, sometimes a company's valuation uh, is highly based on the investor needing a certain percentage of equity in the company. And very often that's so that they can acquire a control stake. So more than 50% or what are the, whatever they need to actually have control of the decisions that are going on in those companies. So you'll see that happening at the growth stage. And then in the private equity markets, we are moving much more into sort of a discounted cash flow, net present value of future cash flow type of analysis. You're looking at more of let's actually value the underlying assets of the company um, and, you know, sort of more traditional corporate finance valuations for the companies. And then of course, I'm sure almost all of you have already made public market investments where we're looking at price to earnings ratio, price to book ratio, you know, multiple of revenue, as well as, you know, obviously asset value. Uh, so, you know, as a company matures, it is moving much more towards actual sort of tangible me measures of value to establish a valuation. And where we are, we very much are establishing valuation based on a range of future outcomes that we see for this company and how we sort of uh, 
decide what is the probability that we end up at a certain valuation. So the underlying math for everything is really discounted future cash flows, but the difference is that by the time a company re reaches the public markets, the future cash flows are a little bit easier to predict and more certain. And at the stage that we're investing, you know, between seed and series A, um, it's very uncertain. So we have to apply that to how we determine the valuation. And this is why people say, you know, valuation is an art and a science. So definitely there's parts of it that are an art. Uh, it's really a science, but I guess the art part is understanding that, um, you know, a big part of determining the valuation is also about meeting the entrepreneur's needs and uh, your relationship with them. So even though it's the last bullet point on the slide, uh, I love to bring it to the forefront because we're negotiating a relationship that is probably going to be going on for a very long term with this founder and we want everyone to feel comfortable with the valuation and the terms of the round. So remember that it's always a negotiation. There is no, you know, there's no like, oh, you hire an accounting firm and, you know, they're going to tell you the valuation of the company. It doesn't really work that way. Uh, it has to do with, um, you know, what you believe about the future of the company and the investment, uh, and then also the availability of capital in the market. So supply and demand is going to weigh heavily on this, you know, uh, the strength of the market for exit opportunities, whether that's the M&A market or the IPO market is going to weigh in heavily. Um, and so, you know, these are some of the aspects that bring sort of more of the, the art view into it. But if we look at, you know, the sort of three things that are the main drivers around valuation, beyond just you know the actual number right which is saying okay the valuation of this company we're investing in uh, series a preferred equity and the pre-money valuation is 10 million dollars right so that's sort of bullet point number three just straight up the valuation um, and whether it's um, a valuation on preferred equity, which is you know, just sort of the number. If it's a note, you might have a note or a save, you might have a valuation cap and a discount. So that would be the same thing for a safe or convertible note, which are other securities that startups use uh, to raise money. And then the next thing that's going to influence the valuation really, or you know, the true valuation is a preferred return. So when people are investing in preferred equity, there's generally a preferred return granted to those shareholders to compensate them for the time value of money. So if the preferred return is 4%, uh, that deal's a little bit more expensive than, say, a company that's offering a preferred return of 8%. So it's important to realize that that is also uh, a figure that is impacting the valuation. The higher the preferred return, sort of the cheaper the deal is for investors, and the lower the preferred return, the more expensive it is. And then the last thing that people largely overlook these days, because liquidation preferences, I want to say, for about the last decade um, have pretty much been completely uh, just always 1x, right? So liquidation preference just means, you know, what, um, when the company has a liquidity event, you know, what multiple of their original capital are the investors entitled to receive, uh, you know, right off the top or, you know, before the equity is split between everybody. Back in sort of like the early 2000s, you would often see liquidation preferences of two or three X. And obviously anything higher than one uh, also makes the deal a little bit more attractive to investors. So it should pretty much always be one, but if it goes above one um, as an investor, you're essentially kind of reducing the valuation a bit without reducing that actual number. So I see we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, okay, great. We have one from Mariana who asks, what's the science behind these three in a convertible note, valuation cap, discount? Um, so I'm not 100% sure that I completely understand the question. I mean, uh, the valuation cap is, you know, just a number, right? So uh, for a, a, a typical convertible note, you know, the valuation cap is going to be set at five, right? The discount is generally going to be set at around 20%. 
I think that it's really important that you just kind of understand uh, what is market for your stage of company and size of round. Um, if you go back to part one of Startup Valuation Explained, I do sort of detail like what the, you know, sort of market numbers are for these different types of things. Um, but basically when we say that it's an art and a science, we say that there is a, you know, mathematical way that we're calculating what we think is reasonable for evaluation, but that the art part of it is also, you know, the negotiation aspect uh, of how a deal is done. And then we have one more question from Heartland, which says, does $6 million for a B2B SaaS platform based in, six million, in Silicon Valley with a strong management team seem reasonable? Uh, so it does. Um, one of the things that I'll say, Heartland, is that, you know, you will notice that Silicon Valley based uh, startups do command a bit of a premium. So it depends on how much they're raising. Um, I would say that, you know, for a round size of anywhere from one to two million dollars, a six million dollar valuation is appropriate. But it's really based on a lot of other factors that have to do with the traction that the company has. So uh, we'll be able to get into that a little bit um, and as well as the fact that you know when it comes to traction and valuation ranges we did cover that in part one so one more thing i see i have uh, uh, uh. okay i can see somebody put something in the q a box i'll just say you know what you guys i'm having a little trouble seeing the q a box so if you have questions for me just put it in the chat because i can actually look at that while i'm doing the presentation so i know somebody just put something in the q a box just moved over to the chat for convenience. Otherwise, I'll get you at the end. All right, great. So moving on to uh, just some of the most basic terminology, which a lot of people are a little bit confused by, is pre and post money valuation. So hopefully, this chart will make it really, really simple to everybody. How what what is the difference between pre and post money valuation, as, as well as why it's important for us to understand the terminology. So if we look at this chart. Let's say that this company that's raising $1 million uh, is raising it at a pre-money valuation of $3 million. So the $1 million is what we refer to as the new money. And you know there is the new money, the pre-money valuation, and then the post-money valuation of $4 million. So pre-money valuation plus the new money equals the post-money valuation. And the reason that we do it this way is because when a startup raises capital, if they're intending to raise a million dollars, uh, they're probably actually going to raise, you know, maybe 750k, maybe 950k, maybe 1.1 million. Right? We don't really know exactly always how much new money is going to come in. So the number that we sort of fix in value is pre-money, and then the new money can sort of be flexible. And then whatever the post money is, when the round is closed, we add it all up and we sort of know what it is. So just remember, pre-money valuation plus new money valuation equals the post money valuation. And when we talk about valuation, we always want to be talking about the pre-money valuation because that is sort of the fixed constant number. Uh, I have a question from Doug who asks, would you mind touching on the effect of valuation if a startup receives resource investment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, that's a good question, Doug. Uh, let's get back to that in a little bit because that's, that's a little bit more detailed answer. And then someone says, should investors negotiate the pro rata rights while deciding? Uh, so when you invest in series A or series C preferred, it is completely standard that you'll get pro rata rights. So, you know, to say, oh, you know, do I need to negotiate pro rata rights? I mean, yes, you should definitely make sure that they're in there, uh, but it probably shouldn't be a negotiation. Um, almost every uh, preferred equity round includes pro rata rights, so make sure that you have them. Oops. All right, so for the seed round, here are some possible valuation methodologies. So the first, as we talked about before, are benchmarks. So you're basically just looking at recent valuation metrics for similar companies. So if you see that, you know, there are three sort of similar stage company in, in similar business with, you know, similar amount of traction or revenue that, you know, did rounds between, let's say, 
you know, five and $10 million pre-money valuations, then you kind of know that your deal should probably get done in that range. Um, and so that's how we use the market to sort of inform the pricing. Uh, so that's one element of a data point that we use. And then the next is something called the Berkus method, um, which is, you know, sort of silly, but it's essentially like, you just kind of like make something up. So <laughs> the way that we would do that here is to say, you know, that the value, and this might uh, answer, uh, Heartland Ross's question, uh, and I'm not sure if Heartland is your first name or Ross, but they're, they're both great first names. Um, this will answer his question a little bit, which is that you allocate about a, about, about a million dollars, up to a million dollars to each of five categories, right? And this is for pretty early companies. Uh, one is a sound idea. Second is, you know, do they have a prototype, right, or an MVP? Third is the quality of the management team, then strategic relationships and product rollout or sales. So each of these categories essentially has about up to a million or so dollars in value ascribed to it. So, you know, you sort of will say, okay, well, their idea is great, that gets a whole million. Their MVP is great, that gets a million. You know, their management team is okay. You know, maybe that's only, they, they still need to fill some spots. So maybe that's worth half a million, you know, strategic relationships are great. That's a million. Their sales, you know, are, are maybe halfway there. That's about 500,000. So, you know, in this case, using sort of the Berkus method, you could say, okay, the pre-money valuation is probably somewhere around $4 million. And this is very much a valuation methodology that would really only be applicable to pretty early stage companies. So when companies are at, you know, sort of the very earliest stage, generally their valuation is somewhere between three and five million dollars um, and that's why we would sort of use this as a way to determine you know where should they fall between sort of that three and five million dollar pre-money valuation range uh, and then next is what we call uh, deferred right and so deferred is not really a hundred percent deferred so when you're using a safe or convertible note to really defer the actual valuation until a price round happens um, this gives you some leeway to not be able to uh, overpay for the round, right? Because your security will have a valuation cap and then it will have some sort of a discount. So let's say that uh, you invest in a safe that has a valuation cap of $5 million and a 20% discount. If the next round happens at $5 million, then you will actually convert your equity uh, into the preferred equity at a $4 million valuation, right? You get a 20% discount. But let's say the next round happens at a $10 million valuation. Well, instead of converting it at an $8 million because you had the $5 million cap, you'll actually convert in at a $5 million pre-money valuation. So it essentially limits, you know, the, up, the highest point of the price that you'll pay, but it also gives you a little downside protection in case the um, round doesn't quite happen uh, at, you know, <laughs> the valuation that they had all hoped for. Um, cool. And so I have one more question uh, from uh, Bravo Patrick. Uh, have you seen the scorecard method used at all? You know, I'm not sure what the scorecard method is. Um, it sounds like it might be something a little similar to the Berkus method. So <laughs> not familiar with that one, but people are always coming up with like cool nifty ways to, to figure out how to value companies. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, myself being a former investment banker, uh, you know, and, a, a, you know, a, a MBA in finance, of course, I'm going to use the venture capital method, uh, which, you know, is much more of sort of a mathematically driven way of determining value uh, than some of these other methods that are used. And this is why if you are going out to raise capital from professional investors, it is really important that you have a very well thought out and detailed financial model because that financial model is actually gonna be used to help uh, your investors apply the venture capital method and determine whether or not uh, your valuation is reasonable. So what are some of the inputs that we use uh, to actually execute the venture capital method? So, what you're basically thinking here is, you know, what do we think that the terminal value, right, uh, at the sale of the company is going to be based on multiple of sales or EBITDA? For 
most of these tech startups, I would say we're usually looking at a multiple of sales rather than a multiple of EBITDA or cash flow because the companies that are acquiring them are really acquiring them for revenue and revenue growth potential, not for their current cost structure. But of course, it could be EBITDA as well, depending on the type of company. Um, so that's the first thing that we need to wrap our minds around. And then the second thing that we need to establish is what is the total amount of equity capital that needs to be invested in subsequent rounds, right? So if this is a $1 million round right now, you know for sure that the company is gonna to need to raise more money in the future. They're probably gonna do a series A, they're probably gonna do a series B. So we need to sort of account for that dilution. Then you need to think about what your target IRR is based on, you know, the number of years to exit. So we'll typically get anywhere from three to five years of financial projections. Now for founders in the room, as well as for investors, we are not expecting you to predict the future, um, but we do want to see that you have a five-year vision for your company. Uh, you know, We'll definitely get companies that come to us with three years of financial projections, and that is fine because I do understand it is much easier to try and foresee the next three years than it is to try and foresee the next five years. Um, but whether it's three or, you know, best case five, we just kind of want, want to understand what's your long term vision for the growth of this company, you know, to when it gets to a point where we might actually be able to exit our investment. So we take these three pieces of information and what we want to do is try to back into a cash on cash return of somewhere between 20 to 30 X of our investment. And the main question that we need to ask ourselves to determine whether or not the company is appropriately valued is do we think this company can sell for somewhere between 10 to 20x the post money valuation? So if the current post money valuation is, you know, let's say $15 million, I'm just basically saying, do I reasonably think that in the next, you know, five years, this company can sell for between $150 million and $300 million? If we feel confident in that, then you know, we think we're on the right track with the valuation. So what are the inputs? So the inputs that you need are the current raise amount, right? the estimated current post money valuation, the estimated future capital needs and where you think the valuation will be you know, for that future money raised, the exit year revenue, so ideally, you know, we'll get about five years worth of projections and then the expected exit multiple of sales. So to get the exit multiple, you need to think about the type of business that you're in and what sort of multiple of sales uh, do these sort of businesses go for. And the target IRR has to be something over 50%. So, you know, realistically, what folks need to know is that, you know, a startup is expected to grow in valuation by at least 50% per year, which is a lot. And that's why we have to be really disciplined about our early stage valuations and making sure that the company is setting a valuation that will allow them to achieve this very high cost of capital and very fertile rate. So we're gonna do a little example. Um, so in this example, we're gonna use some really simple math so that you know, everyone can follow along. Uh, so in this sample company, they're currently raising $1 million the post money valuation on the current raise is $5 million. We estimate their future capital needs to be $5 million. And we estimate that the post money valuation on that future capital will be around $20 million. So this assumes that the company might need to raise a series A, you know, in the next 24 months at a $15 million pre money valuation. If we think that they can get to annual revenues of $25 million within the next five years, and that we think that their type of company would be acquired for a multiple of sales of about 10X, okay, and we're looking for a target IRR of 50% or so. So we're trying to figure out, is this company appropriately priced right now given these assumptions? And we will sort of go into our investment calculate, investment return calculator and actually um, go through the numbers. So I'm just sort of, sort of do it on a high level right now, but I will also switch over to the actual return calculator so that you can see where we provide uh, the opportunity for you to use our return calculator online to calculate these things in a much easier way. So just sort of back of the envelope doing it, 
given our assumption, our initial investment resulted in a 20% stake in the company, right? So invest a million dollars, post money valuation of 5 million, we got 20% um, of the company. After they do their series A, obviously those investors are gonna experience some dilution will be diluted down to a 15% stake, assuming that you, know, you did not want to exercise pro rata or put additional money in. So assuming that the company gets to $25 million in revenue in the next five years and the exit multiple is 10X, we believe that the company should be worth about 250 million, right? That's 25 times 10. So given that we own 15% of the equity, our exit value should be 37.5 million on that original $1 million investment, which is a 37.5X uh, cash on cash return. So the IRR for that is 106%. And even though that might seem really crazy, like an amazingly uh, you know, great investment, and if it happens, that one, that's wonderful, I will be very honest that you know, for a lot of startup investments, you know, the expectation is essentially that the company should double in valuation each year. So a 100% IRR you know, essentially gives you that sort of like doubling each year, and you can see that it adds up very quickly. Um, and that's why we do need to demand IRRs of at least 50% or more. So doing this calculation, you know, we can see that we absolutely met the hurdle rate, which was 50%, and actually potentially doubled that hurdle rate. So I am really quickly going to, oh, there we go, new share, go into our return calculator, and I put the URL at the top. Um, let me bring my share window to front. Okay, great. I put the URL in the top so that you guys can see where to actually access this page. And it's very simple, anybody can use this. So we clicked on get started. Uh, how many years of projections do you have? In this case, we have five years. Now you can input every year of revenue um, if you're wanting sort of the whole detail of your analysis emailed to you at the end. I'm just gonna put in the end year because that was what was critical to our assumptions. You can also input cost of goods sold and operating expenses if you're planning on you know, looking at this as a multiple of EBITDA or just if you want it for your printout. Uh, then we move on to the next question. How much is the company raising total? So in this example, we were raising a million dollars. What's the pre-money valuation? In this example, it was $4 million. Uh, another important question is what percentage will be allocated to a new employee option pool? So if a new employee option pool is being created, you should absolutely put that in there because it can be dilutive to investors, but in this case, we'll skip it. We didn't use it in our assumptions. How much additional capital do you expect the company to raise? So we said $5 million. Oop, ah, enter. And what do you expect the pre-money valuation of the subsequent round to be? And we said $15 million. Okay, what sales multiple would you like to apply? Oop, 10. Okay, great. And how much are you considering investing in this round? Um, you know, we'll put $25,000. Okay, great. And then. Get my results. All right, great. So this will basically pop up a result for you to you know, kind of understand, is this appropriately priced and what would my IRR on the investment be given these assumptions? So this is a handy free tool that you can access on our website. And I will just go back to our slides. Okay, because we have a picture of it here. So as you can see, the startup return calculator helped us to calculate all of these important metrics. So we assumed that you know, it was five years to exit, that it was a 10X sales multiple, which resulted in us estimating a year five enterprise value of $250 million, that the current investor's interest would be 37.5 million, the IRR is 106%, and the cash on cash return is 37.5X. So um, this essentially will help you uh, calculate pretty quickly the potential IRR on a startup investment that you might be considering, or if you're a founder, to help you understand 
is the potential IRR that I'm offering to my investors sort of within the realm of, you know, what's fair or what is market uh, for folks who might be investing. So moving on and just want to see if I have any more questions. Okay, great. So we're good on questions. All right, so moving on to the current market, let's look at some actual market examples. So the first example we have is a great company called Stylist um, that's actually raising with us right now. Uh, fantastic uh, business. They essentially do a shop by text technology uh, and they actually have benefited greatly from the huge shift from you know, shopping in stores to pretty much everybody shopping online. Uh, that has resulted from the recent health crisis. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, where they are in traction. So, you know, as of the time this went up, they, you know, already had 16,000 users. They had really high conversion rates, uh, you know, over mobile purchasing. Um, and they had a pretty strong average purchase price. So all of these elements of traction sort of add to value of a company. They were doing a small bridge round of about $2 million. Um, and so we'll see, you know, what we sort of think about this investment based on the inputs, right? So if we look at, you know, they gave us three years of projections, they're expecting to get close to $60 million in revenue uh, by year three. That's very aggressive. Um, so, you know, you have to think about that. The current raise is about $2 million. The pre-money valuation was 10. And we expect that they're going to need to raise at least another $5 million um, in a series A in the future, which we think, you know, might be done at a pre-money valuation of about 20 million or so. So given that, you know, where would we come out on an investment? So <clears throat> even given all of those things, we're assuming that the company's enterprise value of exit is going to be somewhere around $300 million, which would mean that our current investors value, uh, interest value would be somewhere around 40 million. And that's actually a 20x cash on cash return. So one of the things that we kind of want to think here is, all right, well, you know, that revenue figure, figure was pretty aggressive, um, but it's also, you know, even if they only got to half of where they're expecting to be, we'd still be sort of meeting our at least 10x hurdle rate. And we've certainly, you know, right now we're expected to be at over three times our 50% IRR hurdle rate. So just something to think about as, as to how, you know, we use this analysis to determine, you know, is this falling in the right ballpark or is it completely out of the ballpark? And I would highly advise any of you guys to, you know, uh, go to the investment return calculator and, you know, actually use it for some of the deals you're looking at. Especially, you know, I see people looking at things, um, you know, uh, other startup investment opportunities, and they'll realize that if they actually sort of crunch these numbers and, you know, put the numbers in and do the math, uh, that some of these investments might be a little bit more questionable. Um, and, so, and so one of the other things that we wanted to, to talk about was that, you know, this previous company uh, was doing sort of these small um, insider round prior to their series a so we can see that given their traction and their opportunity for growth the valuation was really pretty attractive um, another great example is a company that has been in our portfolio for a really long time called cabin great technology company they're also doing you know a very small insider round um, at a pretty attractive valuation that's essentially flat to their previous valuation and you're going to see a lot more portfolio companies coming back to the market for sort of smaller amounts of capital that can sustain them through this crisis, which is a wonderful opportunity for investors to add a little bit uh, to their position of companies that are doing well, that are potentially benefiting from um, uh, some of the, the ways that we need to implement technology um, into <laughs> our daily lives as a result of the health crisis. So there's some great opportunity there. So same thing here, you know, we are looking at the assumptions that the current investment of $500,000 is getting done at about a $20 million pre-money valuation, which is on the high side, right? So you have to think, mm, you know, how do I know if this is worth it? We assume that they're going to do um, a $10 million round, you know, probably sometime over the next 12 to 18 months at probably about a $30 million valuation. Here we have their financial projections. This is obviously a company that has much greater growth potential. They envision being able to get to 
$388 million uh, in annual revenue by year five. And assuming everything goes as planned, what does that mean for our investments? So you'll see here, we have to treat things a little bit differently. Given that this is not you know, a pure SaaS technology company, our sales multiple revenue, sale, ah, revenue sales multiple goes from 10x all the way down to 2x. So we're much more conservative about the multiple that we had apply uh, at exit for this company. And using that two times revenue multiple, we get an enterprise value closer to $776 million, but still an IRR on investment of 95% and a cash on cash return of 28X, which is definitely very comfortably within that 10 to 30X ballpark that we're looking for. So clearly there is some really good upside here. So these are just some examples of what's going on in the current market. And, you know, clearly we see thousands of deals and we actually, you know, uh, for the ones that are in our portfolio have, you know, quite a few to choose from. But, you know, how do we apply what we're seeing in the current market to an analysis uh, of how investors might consider about investment decisions and how founders that are approaching the capital markets um, can sort of integrate current market knowledge into their decisions. So what do we know about these current startup equity market conditions? I would say, number one, existing startups that are between pre-series A and pre-series B stage are almost all coming back to the market with very attractively priced insider rounds. I would say that almost every single one of our portfolio companies, um, you know, since the start of the crisis, has come back and said, you know, we want to take in an additional kind of anywhere from half a million to $2 million. And usually at about flat valuations to a previous round. And why this is interesting is that many of those companies are actually growing significantly. And many of them, because we mainly invest in technology, have actually benefited tremendously from the crisis. So we're actually having the ability to, um, you know, reinvest in companies that we know really well that are doing really well at valuations that have not increased at all so when you think about it from a founder perspective we can realize that it's going to be a little bit more challenging for brand new startups to the market uh, to try and raise you know capital from new investors right so the market for those founders going out you know brand new bringing on investors they don't have relationships with is what we would call softer than usual because all of those investors right now have an opportunity to invest in reinvest in portfolio companies um, at prices that are pretty attractive uh, for companies that are growing well. So it's a lot harder for brand new companies to go out and find brand new investors. Uh, we're seeing a lot of successful existing portfolio companies going back for that dry powder. So, you know, the other thing that's really critical is that startups that are in the C to Series B range really need to be aware of this and maintain close communication with investors. And I always tell our portfolio founders this, if you're the type of founder, you know, that's sending out a monthly or, you know, at least quarterly update, uh, maintaining that close communication with your investors is going to make it much easier for you to access the capital markets again and quickly when you need them, right? So your inside investors, you know, hopefully will be uh, your sort of lowest, uh, you know, path of least resistance to additional capital when you need money uh, quickly in a downturn. So maintaining that close communication with investors is important. So for those of you who are founders looking to raise capital, you should think about this. And for those of you who are investors, you know, reminding your portfolio companies that this is part of the job. And then, you know, we're seeing that startups that are looking to raise their very first round, their very first million are just going to find it much more challenging as investors have plenty of opportunity to deploy capital into existing companies that they already have very good information on. So, you know, one of the things that I would say is really tricky is, you know, we're seeing portfolio companies that, you know, maybe have already raised their first million or already raised you know, the one to three million that are um, growing really quickly. Uh, they're you know, solving problems in COVID. They're solving problems in whatever. There's, you know, more uh, technologies being adopted faster into many different industries like healthcare and fitness and, you know, everything, right? Everything's basically had to go online. So they're just, you know, taking off like this. And they're actually pricing their rounds relatively low uh, so that they can get that money quickly. 
And then, you know, you as a brand new company where there's a tremendous amount of execution risk are kind of coming into the market, you know, pitching the same price or the same type of security to investors, but you're much earlier. So it's just going to be a lot more challenging. Um, don't lose hope. You know, things will change eventually. But, you know, real talk, uh, that's kind of the situation that's going on right now. Um, and, and then, you know, as we talk about valuations, I just really want to remind everybody that the most important thing to remember here is that, you know, the concept of binary outcomes is very important in early stage investing. And what we mean by that is that the equity, the value of the equity that you're buying is probably either going to, you know, go to that 10 or 20 X or it's going to go to zero. Right. So, you know, I, I sometimes see investors who are kind of like, oh, you know, um, well, I, I bought this equity and, you know, the valuation on the last round was, you know, two X, like, can I sell it to somebody? You know what? You can't, right? You're, you're in it for the long haul. Um, and so valuation is important, but really what is most important is trying our best to avoid the situation in which it goes to zero and then being able to, you know, sort of hang on with the company, you know, until we get to that 10, 20, 30 X, uh, outcome over the next, you know, probably five years. So, you know, valuation is important, but, you know, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to invest in, you know, 10 sort of lower valuation, $3 million valuation companies, and they all go to zero, right, versus investing in 10 sort of higher quality, higher valuation companies, and maybe, you know, a third of them go to zero, a third of them go to one, and a third of them, you know, get, go to that 10 to 30 X, right? So that's really what we want to be very careful of. Um, and so, you know, the most critical component of the investment is making sure that your company has the ability to survive. If it cannot survive, uh, the potential for that upside, <laughs> obviously that set of outcomes goes to zero. So just be really, really thoughtful around execution risk, um, you know, and uh, what, future capital needs are for the company, um, a low valuation for a company that ends up failing or never reaching scale, which is another thing. If it doesn't reach scale, your investment's going to go to maybe one or possibly zero. It does not help the outcome for the investor. So make sure your valuations are reasonable. And most of all, make sure that the business can go to scale, grow to scale, sorry. Um, and that usually means kind of like at least 20 to you know 50 million dollars in annual revenue so i want to thank you guys so much for spending time with me today um, i love the amazing questions and great interaction that we get during these sessions and if anybody would like to learn more you know please visit 1000angels.com i will follow up with you all with um, a, an email letting you know that if you'd like to set up a one-on-one -on -one with me uh, to talk about 1000 angels membership and investing with us uh, you can do that. I'd love to speak with you. So I will be going over the questions that I could not see in the chat now. Um, so give me a second. I do not know why this chat thing, hold on. This chat thing keeps going behind my, uh, or, there we go, chat. Okay, now I can see the chat. Thank you. All right, so let's get on these questions. Um, so Lindsay asks, you had mentioned on a previous call that you've now seen even 50% discounts due to the current situation. Is this still occurring? Yes, so absolutely, you know, we've, we saw discounts swing pretty low. Um, you know, what I would say as far as just what's going on in the overall market, uh, I would say that we're seeing downward pressure on just prices, right? So on valuations, we're seeing people come back to the market with flat rounds. Um, I haven't seen any down rounds yet, and people really want to avoid down rounds because it's terrible optics. But I have seen discounts uh, get really high. Um, I think people were a little bit nervous at the beginning of the crisis. As you can see, you know, the Fed has really stepped in and uh, flooded, you know, the capital markets with cash and liquidity. So we certainly haven't th seen things get as bad uh, as we expected. And, you know, I think there's a tremendous amount of, you know, sort of macroeconomic risk, uh, you know, through the end of the year. Uh, so, you know, the, the shoe hasn't really dropped yet, you know, 100%. Um, but, you know, as I said, people coming back into the market with companies that have major revenue traction, major revenue acceleration are doing their rounds at flat valuations and people who are brand new in the market for capital are pretty much 
you know, I would say very close to being shut out of the market for capital. So art and a science, it all expresses itself in different ways. Um, so great, I think that's all the questions that we have today. Thank you so much everybody for joining. Um, definitely, if you want a recording of the video, we'll be sending the link after this. And I look forward to seeing you next month. Have a great day.